welcome to From Theory to Practice, How to Integrate AI into Your Everyday Workflows. Uh, before I jump into this session, I want to give a quick intro on what everybody can expect from pretty much the next hour or so. So we have three sessions. Um, our first one, we're going to be covering transforming workflows and looking at how AI really revolutionized everyday marketing, but really more with practical applications that you can start using right now. Our second session, we're going to be joined by the wonderful people at Google to talk through their AI tools and what's next for Google in AI. And then finally, we're going to be chatting through how AI is reshaping the creative process. Um, before we get started, I do want to say I know AI is a new topic. There are a lot of questions around it. We are going to leave some time for Q&A at the very end, but feel free as questions come up as we're talking to chat those questions into the little chat box um, right away when they occur to you, or you can wait to the end. Uh, we'll save all of that and, and go through all of that at the at the very tail end of the the webinar. So let's get started with our first session on using AI to transform workflows. I want to quickly introduce uh, two of my colleagues, John Viano and Jackson Richards. Uh, but before we get into it, John and Jackson, would you mind just quickly introducing yourselves, who you are, your title, what you do, etc.? Sure. I am Jackson Richards, VP of Strategy. I head up brand and growth strategy at Direct Agents. And I'm John Viano, I'm the Director of Client Solutions. Uh, I mostly work on uh, new business developments and um, yeah, been with agency for, for seven years and excited to be talking to y'all today. Awesome, thank you guys. Okay, so I wanna kick it off with um, Jackson just chatting with you really quickly. Uh, we're talking about AI today because it's really all anybody can talk about, right? If you read any articles, go to any uh, conferences or events, AI is really at the forefront of, of all of this. Um, so can you just talk really quickly about how Direct Agents has been thinking about AI, uh, how we've been using it, AI, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, look, the topic of, of AI, it's, it's pervading every conversation today, it, it feels like. Uh, and, and for good reason. There have been a lot of developments in AI technology over the last year in particular that's making real impacts in the, the marketing, advertising, business landscape. Uh, but there's definitely also a lot of noise. Everyone is scrambling to figure out what's real, what's just hype, how they should be leveraging AI, how we as their agency are using AI to help grow their businesses. You know, our, our partners are asking me virtually on a daily basis at this point how they should be thinking about adopting AI into their marketing practices. And for many of us, particularly here at Direct Agents, using AI is nothing new, really. AI tools have been around in the marketing and the advertising world for a long time at this point. But certainly there have been major advancements in the last 12 months, particularly in the realm of generative AI like BARD or ChatGPT or Midjourney or you know the, the tools that seemingly uh, seem to come out every day. Uh, so we've constantly been surveying the landscape, monitoring developments, and thinking about which applications of AI are going to help us grow our clients' businesses. In, in some cases, that means we've identified a, a problem or an opportunity without an existing solution, and we've had to build proprietary tech from the ground up. In other cases, it means that we are curating an agency tech stack of best in class tools to activate for our clients. And then other times for certain workflows, we're just using the same tools that everyone has access to like ChatGPT or Bard and just trying to use them in, in really savvy ways. But really the end goal is it's always the same. It's how can we bore, be more efficient and how can we deliver better results for our clients? So my goal really for this first session here is to provide insight into how we're using AI tools and platforms in different workflows across the agency and hopefully provide some concrete examples of for the folks in our audience of how you can implement AI within your organizations and marketing teams. And, and considering that we have three sessions in this hour, we're not going to go super technical or get into the nitty gritty of implementation. Really, the goal is to demystify some of this stuff for you and hopefully pique your interest and adopt some of these practices with your team. So if there's anything that you want to learn more about, please reach, reach out to us so we can continue the conversation on that particular topic.
So we're really using AI in, in some fashion, more or less across all areas of our organization. So while any one workflow doesn't necessarily fall neatly into a single category or, or agency department, I'd say we're best leveraging AI in the following areas. One is creative and content generation, and we have a dedicated session on this topic just a little bit later. Um, so we'll go into more detail on that. Then um, the others would be research strategy and planning, data analysis and insights, performance media optimization, and written content. Um, written content is something that we'll come back to in probably our next webinar, uh, but those are the, the key areas. I just realized you couldn't hear me for that last one, so I apologize, but you knew the question I was going to ask. You, you can hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, great, perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, no, okay, great. great. So you can't have a webinar without some tech issues, in my opinion, it just doesn't make for good viewing. Um, okay, so thank you for giving that outline. So I wanna start with you, talking through the research strategy and planning part. So I know this is really, for most people, this has been very historically time consuming. It's a really manual process. So can you just talk about some of the ways that you're using AI to make this more efficient, make this a little bit easier, a little bit of a lighter lift for brands? Yeah, so whether we're preparing to run a performance media campaign or we're developing a go-to-market strategy for a new brand or a new product, most of our projects involve a deep research planning and insight development process. Essentially, we need to know who our best fit customers are, who the competitors are, you know, what are they doing, what opportunities do we have to grow market share within the competitive set. So I'll, I'll first talk about audience insights and, and customer segmentation. And this is an area where we use a, a mix of proprietary tech, enterprise tools like Helixa and GWI and Resonate, and then even things like ChatGPT or BARD. And audience tools you know, are nothing new. I think everyone's used audience personas like in their marketing campaigns, right? But advancements in AI have really made them more powerful and allow us to identify untapped audiences for customer acquisition a lot faster. You know, historically, you know, from my experience, most customer segmentation would end up really just being like demographic segments. And while it's useful, it really isn't all that powerful. And now when we're using tools like Helixa, we can analyze, well, it is analyzing billions of data points about how people interact with brands and interact online. And we're able to really determine deep psychographic and lifestyle segments and how each of those segments use different products or services, what are their use cases and needs, and we can even drill down and understand what types of marketing content different segments respond best to, whether it's video or text, what is the appropriate type of, of imagery and tone of voice. And ultimately these insights are used to power our like overarching strategies from website copy to creative and brand direction and, and campaign targeting. Um, you know, and here, here's an example. We can uh, typically when we're bringing a new product to market, we're gonna run focus groups to get insights from potential customers about what they want, how they make purchase decisions. Uh, but it's historically been a time consuming process to run the session, analyze the responses after. Uh, but now we can use tools like Remesh, which we can run focus groups digitally and the AI analyzes and finds trends in the responses in real time, which we can then use to drill deeper into specific lines of questions within the same session. And ultimately it just saves time and gives us better, better data. And really at the end of the day, the more we know and the faster we know about our customers and what they value, the more we can, you know, the, the faster and better we can build strategies that allow us to command a higher price point, drive customer loyalty, and hopefully scale market share. Yeah, I really like the how you you're thinking about that, and it it ties really nicely into that second point, which is the data and customer analysis. Um, so, could you talk a little bit more about um, how we've been able to do or think through customer sentiment, and how we've been able to make pivots based on that sentiment 
for, you know, live campaigns or, or future launches, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's safe to say that all of us at DA, we're, we're data-driven marketers at our core. You know, we believe that, that better data can help us make better decisions. Um, but that also means that we spend a lot of time analyzing data. And I'm sure that that's something that a lot of folks in our audience can relate to. Uh, and, you know, of course, performing the analysis is never the end goal, right? What we're really after is, is the insights. Uh, but now we can use AI to gain insights a lot faster and make decisions more quickly. And what we're finding is that they're impactful decisions. So there are dozens, I would probably, there are dozens there of ways we're using AI for data analysis but I'll give you a few clear examples. Uh, and I'll start with one that anyone who's who's here on this webinar can try this week. Uh, so first, using BARD or ChatGPT to, to quickly analyze some, some simple market sentiment. So as marketers, we always wanna know what our customers and broader market are saying about us and our competitors. It's valuable to you know get that, that actionable information, but sometimes it can take a while to gather and uh, now we can download comments on social posts and ads so from a, a platform like TikTok, let's say. We can take those comments on the posts, input them into BART or ChatGPT, and ask the tool to uncover trends or keywords or recurring themes in the feedback. And it all happens instantly. And then we can use those insights to our form our decisions around marketing, targeting, even product decisions. Um, so that's a really, you know, simple, straightforward way that I think anyone can try. But here's another example that leverages some of our own proprietary technology. A lot of our clients sell on Amazon, and actually a lot of our clients are Amazon first brands. And we know how important it is to optimize your storefront and marketplace presence, right? Your, your Amazon storefront is comprised of so many different variables that all impact performance uh, from your, the product titles and descriptions, A plus content, imagery and video, pricing, and the list goes on. What our proprietary Amazon a AI technology allows us to do is optimize the entire marketplace presence with, with pretty crazy speed. So the AI tracks every single change that is made, whether it's, it's a price change, a product description change, uh, really to any of those variables and in real time provides insights into how those changes impact sales velocity, organic ranking, sell through, profitability, bestseller status, other metrics. So we're using AI to take what, what was once a, a, a process that required extensive data analysis and, and longer tests and made it more or less automated. And the result for our clients is that their e-commerce storefronts are optimized faster, which simply just means more sales. Yeah, I think that is an obvious um, like win for many of our brands. When we think about AI, we think about performance. But I also really love what you talk about with the sentiment, consumer sentiment. Um, I was talking to a brand and we, we were going through how we, we do this type of analysis. And they said when they tried it, they really uncovered some really interesting things, right? Because you think this is how my brand is perceived. This is what consumers think of my brand. And you sometimes live in your own echo chamber of here are my brand values. Here's how everyone thinks of my brand. But then when you ask some of this AI, you upload um, your data uh, with comments and everything like that, you get a diff very different picture and a very different story and thinking through what is the brand value and the brand message I want to put out to the world versus how are people really um, viewing our brand and be able to do that same thing for your competitors and make those real-time decisions to um, the course correct, which I think is really great. Um, so we talked a little bit, you talked a lot about performance, especially with some of the, the AI that the directory just has, has in house. And one of the things I think, like I said, our clients really love is using AI for performance. For performance. And when I talk to a lot of brands, that's really where they're most interested in um, learning more about it right now. There's great things, obviously, for efficiency, which can drive performance, but I want to dive into this part a little bit more. Um, can you just talk about some of the AI that Direct Agents is leaning into just in short to ensure that every dollar that's spent, every dollar that we get of our clients goes a little bit further? Like, what are some of the tools that have been really successful? Yeah, so 
I, I want to be clear. A lot of the advancements that are that are taking place in in AI when it comes to like performance marketing or just kind of digital ads in general are happening at you know on the platform level, like at Meta and and Google, whether it's in in automatic bidding or um, AI driven audience targeting, and you know we work with our clients on on all that stuff. But we're going to go into deep more detail on that in our next session with Google. But what I want to focus is is more in some of the unique uh, tech that we've developed in house, which we call Canopy, which works across our, our paid Google, Facebook, Instagram, um, and Amazon campaigns, uh, where we, we call it Share a Voice. But overall, we call the, the we uh, we call the tech Canopy because it sits on top of the the platform algorithms. And obviously, you know those algorithms are amazing. There's a reason why everyone advertises on on Google and and Meta and why it's so effective. But on those platforms, typically everyone is playing with the same tools. And so we wanted to create something that gave our clients an advantage. And what Canopy does is we built custom automated data pipelines into these platforms where we use AI to analyze all of the different campaign data points from keywords to creative and messaging and targeting. And it all goes into our learning model. And essentially, it identifies the optimal tactics and levers for hitting our specified KPIs based on what is happening in the market at that particular moment. So no opportunities are, are wasted. And for our clients, the KPIs are typically focused around hard metric goals like customer acquisition. And Canopy really allows our campaigns to be more effective and drive better outcomes in that space. We often see like up to a 30% CPA reduction while maintaining or, or uh, expanding acquisition scale. Mm -hmm. But it also frees up more time for our analysts to do that strategic work because Canopy is not only automating the analysis of the, the data, but it's also connected directly to the platform. So it can adjust the appropriate levers in real time. And then also we're using Canopy AI to deliver optimal media mixes and performance forecasts for our clients. So more traditional media mix modeling tools can be, um, you know, they work to an extent, but they can be slow to output recommended uh, media channel allocations and only look at large historical data sets. But where Canopy really shines is that the AI can quickly collect and prepare campaign performance data and then transform it and give really custom recommendations on optimal media channels, customer journeys and conversion paths, day parting, um, while also forecasting the impact of different media plan scenarios on bottom line performance. Uh, in this case, you know, this isn't necessarily something that you can build in house and and implement you know and take away um you know right away but of course if if canopy is something you're interested in learning more about like in how we can help scale your your performance media campaigns uh let us know and we're happy to continue that conversation yeah and that's something i know um as i've spoken with marketers one of the challenges of mmm is they feel it's too slow it's more you know, backwards looking versus more forwards looking. So the AI has really helped us be able to make that more instantaneous, more real time, which has been really obviously exciting. Um, okay, John, I want to pivot to you quickly um, before we, we run out of time and have to yeah. go to our next session. So that's the marketing lens, right? That's all the stuff right. that we're doing right now for marketing and it's our job. So we need to be doing that, but we're all just business people. We are all professionals. Uh, mm -hmm. And you've been doing a lot of work on just how to create efficiencies in your, just your daily workflow to provide more personal um, bandwidth and, and better output. Right. So can you just talk through a few of the things that you've been using AI for that have personally saved you a, top, a ton of time, you know, top yeah. three, top five, whatever it is. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, to your point, I've totally been nerding out on, you know, all the different AI tools that have been out there and that have been coming out over the past six months. And I'm quickly realizing that there are so many different ways that you can use these tools to automate some of the day-to-day -day tasks that you're you're doing, or at least make the process, you know, a little bit faster or more efficient in some way. So, taking a step back from from the marketing world and just like looking at the overall business world, anyone within you know business, how can you use some of these AI tools to uh, make your life a little bit more efficient? So, I've realized there's three different categories outside of generative AI. There's there's three different categories, and it's really research, it's content data analysis, some quick content data analysis, and finally, um, 
just automation, day-to-day -day automation. So let's start with research. Uh, the way that we've been trained to kind of research over the past 20 years has uh, really been just, you know, you ask Google a question and Google is going to give you a series of links that you can click on um, and look through to find the answer to your question. Now, to be fair, those links have always done a pretty good job of having the answer to your question. But um, the, with AI coming into the picture, that process is evolving and it's evolving quickly. Uh, and the way that it's evolving is that, you know, now you're basically having a conversation with the internet, right? So think about your experience with ChatGPT. If you ask ChatGPT a question, it's going to directly answer your question. Um, the one limitation with ChatGPT is that it has data only up until 2021 versus there's some other alternatives like Google Bard or my personal favorite, Perplexity, um, that has access to the full internet and even gives you uh, or provides links to where it's pulling that data from. Um, so just to show you kind of an example, and Sammy, you can, you can kind of play the video here. Um, let's pretend that we're a cosmetics brand that is doing some competitive analysis. Um, we want to look up what Supergoop is, is all about and what they're doing. So the first question I ask is, tell me about Supergoop, and it gives me just kind of a synopsis of the brand, their top performing products, and as a follow-up question and this kind of conversational feel, I said, what, how, what digital marketing have they done today? And it literally answers my question. It gives me different strategies, different channels that they use, different tactics that they use. And then I can click out onto the link where it's pulling that data from and get more information if I wanted to, right? And there was a full interview, an hour-long interview with their CEO where they're talking about the different marketing tactics that they've been doing over the past couple of years. So I think it's just, you know, the way that we research now is is that much you know that much more faster and and also you know we're able to get more accurate information that is um you know basically kind of a conclusion of all the different you know links that are that are you know out there and all the information that's out there so um that's definitely been an area of efficiency i think another area of efficiency if we can go on to the next slide is some quick content and data analysis. So I, I don't know if you've all heard, but ChatGPT just launched something like Code Interpreter. And there are dozens of different tools out there that can you know, read and interpret PDF documents. Uh, but this is ChatGPT's native uh, solution. It, it's called Code Interpreter. And basically, you can upload everything from a PDF to a raw CSV or an Excel file and ask questions about that data. Um, so I, if we play the video, you can see here, I pulled a just demo data of campaign performance to date. Um, and I'm able to get that, that CSV file and just directly in, in, uh, upload it into uh, ChatGPT and just start asking questions about it. And, and, you know, I said, first, tell me about how the CPA has been performing uh, year to date. And it even creates charts. It visualizes the data for me. I asked to do it to do the same for ROAS. Um, and from there, I just uh, started asking like, hey, you know, what was the best performing months? Um, what are some other general insights that you can pull from this? This in no way is, it, is going to replace, you know, Power BI or some of the um, reporting that you're getting from a digital marketing agency. But if you're looking for some quick answers, some quick analysis, or if you have like a textbook that you're trying to ask um, questions uh, about, you can upload this information now into these tools and ask questions and have a natural conversation about it. For those of you who don't have ChatGPT Plus or don't subscribe to the service, there are a lot of other free alternatives. I've also been using uh, Claude AI by Anthropic, which is also super powerful. Um, and yeah, and then going on to like the final you know, area of efficiency, um, and that's day-to-day -day automation. And, you know, really, this has been a around for a really long time, but I just, I feel like I personally haven't been able to wrap my head around it until um, it incorporated some chat GPT features and natural language models. Um, and so basically what these uh, no-code automation platforms are, are able to do is connect all the thousands of different applications that you work with on a daily basis. So think Gmail, Google Calendar, um, you know, Slack, Pipedrive, Salesforce, whatever application you're using and automate different processes across those applications. Um, so what's really cool is that now they've incorporated this ChatGPT feature where you could say, hey, I have a specific thing that I wanna automate, tell me how to do it and let's make it happen. So if you play this video, this is just a very quick example. I said, listen, anytime my brand is, is mentioned in Twitter, can you send a Slack to my marketing team? Um, 
And I just put that in there and it told me exactly how to do it. And honestly, all I had to do was log into my Twitter, log into my Slack, and it took care of the rest. So, uh, you know, there, th this site has uh, thousands of different templates that you can use. Some cool ones that I saw is you can upload a video uh, to your Google Drive and use ChatGPT to interpret it and then create different posts for all the different uh, social media platforms and optimize for those media platforms. So you'll get a different post for LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, you know, TikTok, whatever the case may be, um, you know, for more lead generation, you know, if you have a lead that comes into your landing page, you could send a Slack to your sales team. You can uh, set up an account on Pipedrive and you could also automate the process of sending an email to that contact, looking at my Google calendar and asking, Hey, when's the next time that you're free? Here's, here's my availability. Um, so, you know, all of these different automations and, you know, different tools is really meant to just kind of just carve out a couple, you know, minutes at a time. Maybe you're saving 15, 10, even five minutes, um, you know, a, a day on on these tasks. And if you could save five minutes a, a day, I mean, I think that's that's gonna, you know, add up over time. Um, I think the challenge that I have for all the viewers today is just think about what are day-to-day -day tasks, what are week-to-week -week or even month-to-month -month tasks, and just go to ChatGPT and ask, hey, is this something that I can automate? And it's more likely that you can. And Again, if you were able to save that time, you know I think this uh, this webinar uh, was a success. So that's all the time I have for you all today. Um, with that, Megan, I will turn it back to you. John, you're stealing the secret. You're giving everyone the secret sauce of if you're a direct agents client and your account team reaches out to you frequently saying congratulations on this thing because we saw it on on Google News or something. You're telling them how we know everything so quickly. Don't give yep. don't give it all away. Um, okay, I'm kidding. Um, but thank you, John and Jackson. I really appreciate it. So now uh, I want to welcome on um, Alex and Amanda from Google and then Corey Levine from Direct Agents. We are, are going to talk through how Google is approaching AI and what the future holds with media buying uh, using AI. Hello, everybody. Um, thank Hello. you so much for, for being here. I know everyone's really excited for this, this session. Um, so could you quickly introduce yourselves as well before we get started? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in, I'll go first. Um, hi everybody, my name is Corey Levine. I am the VP of Integrated Media here at Direct Agents and I oversee the paid media strategy across the agency. Cool, I'll go next. Hi everybody, I'm Amanda Feld. Um, I'm a strategic agency manager at Google. So I work with top agencies like Direct Agents on their Google advertising and help bring them the latest and greatest in the industry. Hi, I'm Alex Sewich and I'm a product lead on, uh, well, pretty much performance products here. So some research, smart being automation. And I work with uh, the global leads and PMs and uh, actually introducing best practices in the landscape of agencies and customers. So it's very excited to be here. Awesome. And like I said, I know everyone's really excited to hear about what Google is doing with AI, what the future of AI looks like um, for Google. So I want to start with more of like, before we dive into the details, more macro, because I think a lot of people don't understand some of the details on how AI actually works, and that causes a lot of confusion down the line. So Alex, you are probably the best person to speak to this right here. Can you just talk to me, how does, how does AI actually work? That's a great question, isn't it? Even the, I guess the people who build the, uh, the actual AI tool have a hard problem like defining it. But in a nutshell, um, it's the ability of machine to learn from experience and the data. And the key here is to understand is that, like actual, they're taking the predictions and experiences. There's no like hard code involved. It's just simple math, right? You give it a goal, which is called reward function or Q, and the system will make, make math predictions to chase the goal. It makes some sort of actions, it observes the environment and sees how, uh, what happened really. And if uh, it was a success based on the Q function, that reward, it repeats only successful actions. It's called reinforced or positive reinforced learning. And the cycle repeats again until it becomes really perfect. So the ability of machine to mimic the, how human will solve the problem and uh, making the math predictions to get to that reward is that's what uh, machine learning is. And there's a different system using Kiki can build on it, but the key that you have to have a reward function and you have to that have a process of really reinforced learning to get to what your desired outcome is. Okay, that's really, that's very helpful. I know you said sometimes even people who are in AI have a hard time talking about it. I 
remember hearing something once that said like if you can't explain it in you know two sentences or something maybe people don't understand but i don't think ai fits into that is so much more complex um okay so let's pivot to the implications right so we talked a little bit about how we're using ai in the last session but i'd love to hear from you what are the largest implications for marketers where do you think marketers get the most value from ai yeah, I think early adoption is key. AI and marketing, it's not a future concept, it's here. And you don't wanna be the ones waiting before you embrace it because your competitors are already diving in, they're already becoming experts. Um, we're seeing most marketers happily embrace AI and marketing. So if you haven't yet, what are you waiting for? Um, I think the first and most important step to assess your business and decide, is to assess and decide which conversions matter to your overall business objectives. So don't just think about your campaign objectives, but for your business objective, what matters most? Once you identify that key conversion or key goal, um, you ensure, of course, proper tracking, you understand how things should be set up, and then you have that solid foundation ready to utilize AI and to continue to grow with AI as AI capabilities continue to grow and evolve. So the success of everything you do within Google Ads, like bidding, creative, format, all that is contingent on you having the correct conversions listed in the system as your priorities. Like Alex said, it's learning based on what you input. So as long as the inputs are correct and the conversions are really what matters for your overall business, everything like smart bidding um, will just help you reach those right people in the right time. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Hey, Corey, yeah, like what's your perspective on that? So that's obviously Google, um, for Google, what is the most important and what marketers really need to kind of double down on. But do you find that that's like uh, also like the macro trend or yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, one is I'd like to stress what Amanda said. Um, I do believe that early adoption is going to be key to success for all marketers and brands. But, you know, while it's hard to say exactly what the biggest implication is going to be on marketers since it is changing so frequently um, and we were at the beginning, I do believe the biggest immediate impact for media buying perspective is going to come from how buyers are setting up their campaigns and are able to test creative variations at scale. So we've already seen platforms, Google, Meta, everyone's making huge pushes towards more of that automated creation through a Performance Max or an Advantage Plus, and everybody's rolling out generative AI capabilities, whether it's for text or images. Um, however, in the long term, I'm actually bullish on the impact AI will have on measurement, especially in a world where data privacy continues to make measurement increasingly difficult, and AI could be a great way to kind of absolve that gap a little bit. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'm really also excited about like the future of, of personalization and how that will obviously change as AI gets a little bit more sophisticated. So for right now, the value and what most marketers can do is really just start testing, right? Start testing, start testing the water, start trying things, even if you're maybe not super comfortable and making sure things are, are set up. Because Amanda, to your point, if if you're not doing it now, if you're not using these AI tools, you are, you're going to be left behind, obviously. Um, so the other thing I really want to talk to you guys about is, is the mindset of marketers. Because AI, if you talk to anybody in the AI space, and Alex, you probably feel like this has been going on forever. When I talk to anybody who really works in AI, like this has been coming up the last you know, five, seven years. Um, it only has really gotten the attention and the hype in the last year or so or maybe even mm -hmm. not year six months or so right um and that is a very short amount of time for the mindset of marketers to change um, and we're asking people to really to really change their mindset on how they approach media buying and how they approach interacting with google and um and marketing in general right and, and we were talking a little bit about this before that when i talk to people and when i talk to brands a lot of the beef that marketers have with ai and some of the platform tools is just that lack of transparency mm -hmm. but i think it's because they don't they don't understand it maybe as well as as they should so can can you guys just talk about how you think marketers mindsets need to change to be successful how you need to you know how did you think of things before and how should you think of things now yeah exactly and i think you you definitely hit hit there in in, in on head and nail uh it just uh historically right the people didn't have that uh, outcome based mentality that's why we're trying to actually shift towards if the ai gives you that opportunity to 
to chase the goal, right? To get that dopamine from machines. So get the machine high to get it actually addicted to getting you more conversions, more revenue. Mm -hmm. And whatever happens in the between, right? That the place where actually it just mathematical predictions. There's no like hardcore algorithm, right? So that's why there's the, there's no black box in a say. There, we have like marketing term black box, but there's, there's no black box. It just learns, makes math predictions. And next time it gets better and better and better. It's all the math, it's just simple formula, like your return on ad spend, your CPA. It just tries to hit that target you hit, you get, right? So that's why you need to shift up from that old school mentality of micromanaging different inputs, like manual CPC bits and all that stuff. Stuff, right to more of like a outcome based approach where you start with uh, film the data the data is going to be most differentiating point for you moving forward to the more the better data you give it to the better you inform the algorithm right to so start from there from your proper conversion tracking information you can bring safely with privacy in, in place for the for the system to analyze then you make an approach uh, great content you using the the great tools you have from the ai space right now to create a, the most authentic content which people are gonna like and then you also make sure you don't limit yourself you're casting the wide net of reaching as many people as possible within that your target audience and ai can do that for you you don't have to again micromanage different settings right it finds it for yourself and then it makes the adjustments make predictions it gives you insight what works or not Good example of people discovering things they or audiences they've never heard before was a company who was doing a, a shelf foods for doomsday preppers, right? A really niche category. They couldn't scale. They couldn't find uh, who else they can say the um, you know sell those products to. And through, through discovery for AI categories, they've been able to find actually that uh, sale enthusiasts or people going for long sale trips are actually perfect for that market, right? They've been able to uncover that brand with like casting by net, don't be restricted yourself. AI helped them to find that niche category and they like quadruple their sales next month, right? So just power of that one is focusing on outcomes and then adjusting the targets rather than the micro settings. That's a key here to change the mindset towards you. I want to hear from Amanda and Corey, but I, Alex, before you, uh, we go on, I just think it's really funny that a doomsday pepper product was being driven by the success of AI. It just feels very like... Right? Um, it's a really, really niche category, exactly. <laughs> if they only knew. Um, okay, anyways, um, Corey, Amanda, I'd love to get your perspectives on this. Yeah, well, I, I actually love something that Alex mentioned, which was, which was focusing on the outcomes. And I think a lot of brands and marketers, in order, like they really need to get comfortable with embracing AI as it relates to their optimization strategies. Alex and Amanda were mentioning the bid strategies and, and ensuring you're ranking your conversions, but the optimization flywheel has changed. And I feel that many marketers though are still living in the past. What I mean by that is a lot of brands out there are still over-optimizing their campaigns, trying to put a manual optimization approach on things. And what that results in is asking their agency, their in-house teams, their partners to over-optimize based on small data samples, which can actually lead to poor performance and hurt the overall flywheel. So what can marketers do? Like that is not saying marketers need to just sit back, you know, and kind of just let the, the algorithm do its thing. But marketers need to be focused more on understanding how the AIs work and, and analyzing larger data sets because the AI is only as good as what it's being fed. The, in, the output's only as good as the input. And so we need to be focused more now as marketers on analyzing larger data sets, focusing on how that kind of ladders into the overall strategy and making bigger, more impactful changes, then giving that AI the proper time to adjust, test and perform within itself and then rinse and repeat. But I think, uh, so the biggest thing would be that mindset shift to adjusting what we believe optimizations are and the role marketers and agencies play in that in order to ensure success and scale for the future of your, of your brands. Yeah, AI is our friend. 
I think people hear artificial intelligence and they think of those early 2000s movies where robots are taking over the world and stomping on your cars. But in reality, AI is here to help us in ways that we didn't even know were possible. Um, the main attribute marketers need is trust. AI is not some machine that's going rogue, but as Alex explained earlier, it's like that precise ability to learn from signals you provide and that it observes. So that's why the conversion alignment that I mentioned is so important because the success of AI in your marketing campaign depends on the signals and those parameters that you provide. But as long as those and the constraints are all set, um, you just need to trust the system and it'll provide the optimizations based on those signals, things that aren't humanly possible. And then that's how you'll see success in the AI driven world. Yeah, I think that's really important. I liked all of those points because it is going to be a really big shift for brands, for marketers, not just for themselves, right? For us all who are, are working with Google every single day, but how you communicate that upward as well, right? It is about selling that upwards, making sure you really understand it, you understand um, some of the nuances so you can properly communicate it and communicate it within your organization. Because, um, Corey, to your point, um, there are a lot of probably brands and marketers doing themselves and their campaigns a huge disservice the way because they are stuck in the mindset of, you know, 2018 or whatever it might be. So, um, Hopefully, we, if you, anybody has questions about that or how to position things internally, please reach out. We would be happy to help. Um, okay, so I want to dive into Performance Max a little bit. Can't, we can't talk to Google about AI and not talk to about Performance Max. So it's one of the things most marketers are familiar with uh, when it comes to the Google AI capabilities. So can, um, can you guys just talk a little bit about how Performance Max is going to affect client performance? How does it affect client success? What have you, what have you seen? Yeah, absolutely. And then I think that like, continuing the conversation of uh, how we can find the best fit co potential customer, the next best ROI and efficiency for your customers, mm -hmm. right? And it gets really tough when people only 5% you know, of the time spending on search, which is by itself is a huge amount of time, but the rest of that they are spending on other display on YouTube, they're watching other content, right? Is the ability to find them cross network is that's what challenging and the search gets more and more expensive if all the inflation and all the kind of your potential competitors are stepping in right there. So the that linking together and then chat with the AI and finding that because like Pmax is a goal oriented campaign, right? It's the same like AI, it's like reward function there. I want to get your the ROAS you're looking for, I want you to get your CPA you're looking for, and that's what we try to optimize for. But now only, not only in the in the search or shopping, but also chases for thousands and thousands, millions of other websites where like your customers are, right? So that ability to find the, the next best return for your, uh, for your investment, the customer uh, across, it's pretty much every part of the, their customer journey, and that's what differentiate Pmax, and that's what make it more efficient, because it's much cheaper to find them um, in other networks versus only chasing. It still does that search component, but also it brings that wealth of uh, cross-channel network optimization and finding the next the next user. Right, that efficiency it actually helps to save you a cost. Right, so from um, millions and millions of customers and the campaigns we have seen so far, right? So for like the for lead gen perspective, we already see that it, it Pmax drives 18% on average, better efficiency, more conversions for your cost per acquisition, right? And on the retail, which have evolution of smart shop, making like a 25%, so even higher. So that ability to bring up the cross channel data and use Power BI to find the best customer, that's what differentiates Pmax and that's where we see early success for sure. Yeah, and awesome. before, before we even move on to the next question, I think it's important to kind of even just back that up. Um, talking across our, our clients, I'm not going to throw out like a specific benchmark because performance varies so greatly on, on, on different levels. But the main thing that we have noticed at Direct Agents is when we are running Performance Max, because we are actively testing all of these um, AI driven campaigns. And also, one thing to note for other marketers out there is sometimes these campaigns actually run in different auctions sometimes for internally. So, like, there's an AI one versus standard. So it doesn't make sense yet to just go all in. But when we are testing the AI against the standard, what we have found is that the performance is backed up by the data and we have seen more than not performance be out performance max performance. That's, that was a mouthful. Um, kind of ex exceed the standard performance. And so while we continue to test that, 
I think what Alex was saying is, is right, where we have also seen very similar trends for all the clients that we have running Performance Max. Yeah, and I think it, it goes to what you're saying, it's really hard to give an exact metric, but it's about also making sure when you are running Performance Max that you have everything set up correctly, right? If, you have, if you're starting from a bad place, if you're starting from um, poor quality data and no segmentation, like that's not gonna be good for anybody. So if you start from a good place, you can kind of get to a good place um, with Performance Max. Performance max. Um, okay, so I want to pivot a little bit to consumer behavior. So on the on the consumer facing side, I saw that Google recently released released the new AI powered like try on feature for apparel brands that users can essentially uh, virtually try on um, tops essentially uh, from different brands, choose models that look like them, their size or shape, etc. Which I think is really interesting. We're talking a lot about the marketing implications, but I do think some of these consumer facing AI, AI launches have and will affect consumer behavior. So, and that will obviously affect us as marketers and where we spend and how we spend. So can you talk a little bit about um, some of the things that, you know, Google is releasing and how you think that will affect how users engage with Google and just consumer behavior overall? Absolutely. I think the consumer side is a big part of it. And I believe we will see a lot of these new AI powered features coming that similar to the try on feature you mentioned will benefit both the consumer and the marketer. So it's making things easier for the consumer because you know you can try things on from the comfort of their home. Who doesn't love that? Um, and then from the marketer, from an advertising execution standpoint, it's a lot easier as we discussed. And then also from a conversion perspective, if I'm hesitant to buy something, but I can try it on from home, it'll convince me of my interest and then I'll ultimately convert. That's a win for the marketer as well. In terms of new launches and what's coming, there are constantly betas being rolled out and being used by those savvy early adopting marketers. Uh, the great news is that by being a client of a Google Premier Partner, like direct agents, uh, they have access to these betas, features, and formats. So before they're released to the public, we can access them and we can test out what makes sense for your client. Great plug, Amanda. I tried. <laughs> Um, Corey, I'd love to get your perspective on on kind of like broader consumer behavior as well. 100%. Um, I do believe that plat how platforms like Google integrate AI capabilities into their products will 100% shape consumer behavior. I'm going to be very bullish on that prediction and say 100%. Um, the reason I'm so bullish is because, so I'm personally a Google Lab user. And so I have now Google Bard integrated into my Google search app on my phone. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is that not only am I thoroughly enjoying my new experience, but as a consumer, what I expect from Google has completely changed. When I go to Google, Google now and I do a search, I expect more of a conversation style um, response from Google on their SERP. And I love that I can either decide at that moment to scroll down and converse, or I could choose to converse with Google by pressing the converse button which opens up the BARD interface. And so I think just knowing that, I do believe that we've all heard this before, voice was supposed to completely change how a user searches with Google. And look, uh, yes, maybe it did, but not like this. I, I as a marketer, I'm, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna put Alex and Amanda on the spot, although we talk about this all the time, about how, what that means for marketing and the ads and all that stuff. That's a whole different conversation, but how, consumers will adapt based on AI with Google, I believe, yes, 100%, they're gonna expect a different type of search experience, more robust answers, and I think that that in itself will just change the landscape, and then marketing will follow. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, okay, so I think we have time for one more question that I'd love to get you guys' perspective on. Um, so I want to know, so you guys live in, in this AI world and, and Amanda, you mentioned there's always like betas and, and things like that, um, uh, that people can get access to. Um, so again, if, if you want access, please contact us. We will, we'll see if this is possible, but I want to know the one AI tool that currently, Google currently has that you don't think marketers are using enough. So if, if people were to leave and say, okay, I need to start doing this, but I don't think I know where to start, what would be the one most underutilized thing Google has uh, launched in AI that people don't use? Yeah, absolutely. And then I think you you continue the, the seeing the trend for us talking about that product for, for a long time. We've been talking about that product a long time. It's not a secret that Broadmatch was one of the oldest products we have. 
it was a powerful but yet imperfect solution back in the days when I started it more than 10 years ago. We all seen there, we all had some challenges of adopting it early on and uh, making sure that it has a precise audience targeting note. Uh, recently, it has dramatically changed with a lot of uh, with large language model adoption with Google actually pioneered since 2015. It got smarter and smarter. So now it can understand the like, actual intent, what people are looking for. It understand the content of your website and landing page. It, it understands the previous searches you did uh, or the customer did. Uh, it is acknowledging uh, the keywords within other match types in, in your actual ad group itself. So you got much smarter with predictions. So back in the day, if you had a keyword for uh, treating your pet at home, you know, it could have matched to treats for pets, which is totally unre unrelated, right? Of course, it doesn't do it anymore. But then now, because of understanding intent, it actually can match to the keywords which you not explicitly have in your actual broad match term itself. So treating a pet without the pet, even though you not explicitly have it at home, but you can actually understanding that you don't require the, the vet actually to treat the pets, right? So like understanding that and when you, Pairing that, understand the intent with large language model with the power of smart bidding, right? When you pair those two, actually we see that uh, comparing to your other match types and evolution from that, you're seeing 35% more conversions through the same cost per acquisition, right? Because you're pairing the smart bidding power of AI of understanding and targeting that conversions you're chasing for with better understanding and matching technology for the evolution of broad match that gets more powerful powerful. So yeah, I know you've been there for a while in the, in the market, but you have, uh, if you haven't tried it or for a while, the broad match, or give it another try, pair with smart bidding, uh, make sure you know it learns and predicts uh, what you're looking for from the target perspective. Yeah, Alex, I will say this is not the broad match that maybe I grew up with. So it is a totally different beast. Um, so I, I encourage people to, to check it out as well. Um, Corey, what about you? What are, what's one thing that people um, aren't using enough? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I won't talk to one specific Google product, but I'll, I'll end it with, I don't think that marketers are testing different AI tools enough in general. And I think that that could be out of fear of performance or the unknown or, or what Megan mentioned about the trust. But the truth of the matter is like here at DA, we've embraced these tools. Like we know they're not going away. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna put your head in the sand, I, I highly advise against that because this is not gonna be a fad that just disappears. Um, so we know that we believe in that here, and so what we've done is we continue for all of our clients to rigorously test and gain initial learnings. We feel it's imperative because the more you learn, the more you train these algorithms, the better they're gonna get. And so if you could add your data into what Google is doing, maybe you don't see that great performance right out the gate, but it will get there. And like I said, it's not going away. So the big thing is, um, Alex mentioned broad. I'm going to take the stand of not enough brands and marketers are testing AI solutions due to the fact that they don't know what it will do to performance or they get that cold feet. But I, I just I cannot recommend enough to not to, to kind of fight that that feeling and just jump in and it, and um, continue to learn, continue to test and grow um, the clients that we are running that are seeing those tests they're feeling good performance from it. And so we're excited to continue to gain those learnings and continue to roll those out. Perfect. Yeah, and to your point, Corey, if people are worried about transparency, I wrote this down because it was like one of my favorite things that was said. Uh, Alex, you said there is no black box. So there's not like a secret black box somewhere. So I love that. That's how I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the session. Um, thank you guys all for such a really great conversation. So um, next, I'm gonna pass it off to Jackson Richards, who's gonna be leading our next session on AI and creative. It, thank you guys for, for tuning in for this wonderful chat. All right, happy to be back. And we have two new speakers with us. Uh, we have Valentina Elegante, our Associate Director of Creative and Content at Direct Agents, and Catherine Grabowski, who is our Senior Creative and Content Specialist. And, you know, for the first, you know, 45 minutes or so of this webinar today, we've been talking about AI more as it pertains to data analysis and campaign optimizations and uh, the nerdy stuff, right? 
there's a whole other side to marketing, which we have not really touched on yet, uh, which is the creative side. And creative, this creative side of things is being impacted and advanced through um, AI tools just the same. So we want to make sure that we end with a uh, great discussion on, on this side of things. So opening it up to, to Valentina and Catherine, I'll start with just a broad question. Give us some insight into how you're utilizing different AI tools into your day-to-day -day workflows as you're working on creative projects. Yeah, absolutely. So I think any creative professional or anyone on any sort of design team is um, aware that project management processes really can make or break um, a creative project or creative deliverables. Um, so everyone's probably seen the final version 15 that probably isn't even the final version yet. Um, so making sure that we have these processes in place to have a very efficient workflow um, is very important to the success of our creative outcomes. Um, so here at Direct Agents, we use a variety of tools. We use ClickUp to monitor uh, projects and timelines. We use Miro and Frame.io, which is really for the final presentation. Um, and we use Figma as a collaborative design tool. Uh, so Figma is essentially like a giant whiteboard. So you can have multiple designers on the board at one time, uh, collaborating, adding notes, updating designs. Uh, and we use this for a lot of our web design and SAG design projects. Uh, well, Figma actually just recently acquired Diagram, which is an AI integration. Um, so this is really allowing for a lot more sophisticated design tools through the platform. Um, so if you can see in the video on the left here, they now have generative AI where you can type something such as albums and um, Figma will automatically recommend different interfaces that you could use on this mockup. So it saves a lot of time on, on the design side uh, when we're designing these web pages. Um, and then they also have the magician tool, which um, will automatically recommend icons or images or copy uh, that really fits and feels cohesive with, with the design that you're already creating. Um, so this is just one of the many examples in ways that these programs that we're using are becoming way more sophisticated um, and really helping us to be more efficient in our day-to-day -day workflows. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants to see like version final, final V16 again. But you know, as you're saying that, I'm, I'm seeing that you know, it, these are tools that allow our, you know, creatives and designers to get to that final product faster, not necessarily, um, you know, creating something that would have been otherwise different. Yeah, exactly. And that perfectly segments it to just how crucial that foundation is within that project management and that concepting, but we're also able to integrate these different tools when we're actually executing. A perfect example here that has saved just so much time is rotoscoping. So for those of you who don't know what rotoscoping is, it's essentially the process in which video editors have to manually outline frame by frame the, uh, the certain subjects. So you'll see on the video here, on the left, how time consuming it actually is because it's every single point with every uh, every single motion just to specifically edit the subject or edit the background separately. But now with this AI integration, with a couple of points, we're able to map out that subject. The AI is able to understand and really just scan the scene to see what that subject is and pan it out throughout, throughout the rest of the scene and really just moving forward. But all this new times, again, saving days or upon weeks just allows the video editors to focus on the larger picture. What is the goal of the video? Are we actually hitting that? Do we want to provoke or are we evoking the emotions that we were really intending in the beginning? So this is just a, a really cool tool, Jackson, what you said of not replacing, but just doing the stuff that we were already doing just in a much quicker fashion. Yeah, and that's a great example of a specific workflow where that output is expedited. Um, and there, I know there's many others, you know, just like this, that, that kind of get us to those finished products faster. But, you know, what, what I want to know is, you know, any creative project, there's so many different phases of it, right? From the brainstorming and, and initial ideation to coming up with uh, messaging concepts and, and different design concepts. Can you kind of walk us through how we are using AI um, at different stages of the creative process? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so AI can really be used as um, a collaborative tool that we can tap into from campaign ideas and co copywriting to final design. Um, so for example, on the campaign ideation phase, I put a sample brief into um, an AI tool. So think of this as almost a creative brief where I'm telling the tool, okay, what's the client? What is the campaign goal? Uh, what are the overall brand goals and who's the target audience? Um, so really summarizing all of our findings and research into this brief. Um, and then ChatGPT was able to deliver me uh, four or five overall cam campaign concepts with assets included. Um, so then as a creative strategist, I'm able to review these concepts and pull out, uh, okay, which campaign really makes most sense for our brand goals, our project restrictions, um, and our overall project, our project goals, um, and able to refine and tweak that. So I'm not spending time on that initial brainstorming phase because uh, I really have a jumping off point from these AI tools. Um, and then on the next slide, putting this back into, into these AI tools for copywriting um, so I can get a video script, asset copy for paid social campaign, and even hashtag, campaign, hashtag campaigns for influencers to use. Um, but this is really, again, just a jumping off point. So copywriters can then focus on refining and tweaking and making sure that this copy is optimized for each specific campaign. Um, but even taking a step further and Say we want to talk to CMOs and college students. Um, so taking that final copy, putting it back into those tools and saying, um, okay, speak to me like a CMO or speak to me like a college student. Um, so again, we're really using this as setting the foundation, the framework for a campaign. So we're able to spend more time making sure that this really aligns strategically with our overall goals. One thing that I'm I'm noticing here too is, you know, the we, we all know this, like the, the quality of the outputs from these generative tools like like ChatGPT or, or BARD are really dependent on the quality of the, the prompt. And so I, I noticed that you're to get these good outputs, we're feeding in a lot of, of information and data about exactly what we're looking for. And for, for anyone out here who's listening, we're happy to walk you through um, some of our tactics for, for doing that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And continuing the pre-production process, this is actually uh, in beta right now, but I'm very excited because this would be very useful for our team, is the storyboard creation feature. So what we're able to do is take that final script, upload it into the platform, and it will create visuals for the storyboard. So you'll see in the video here, we upload that script and you're able to give uh, details like we want to have an exterior shot, we want to have a wide angle shot versus a close up hero shot, and it will create scene by scene what we're looking for. And this is really one of the main components within the pre production phase because it sets the tone of the visuals. What is that production going to look like? What do we need? What shots we really need, need to make sure that we, we nail? And also, this is the time that it takes the most because we're going back and forth with the client or the different teams to really make sure that we nail it. So something like this allows us to free up resources from our graphic design team and make sure that uh, people like Catherine and I or um, our video team are able to just continue to plug in and refine. So although it's in the, the beta mode, we're, we're super excited to, to see this one. And on the next slide here, this is a tool that is exciting for the post-production. So now that we've gone out into the world, we've gotten that original production, we got all the shots that we needed, we're able to use this assistant editor to create that first round. That's the one that really takes the most time because not only do the does the video team need to go through scene by scene, see what's out there, see what we've gathered, but also now figure out what that storyboard is going to look like. But with here, we're able to upload our script, again, that finalized script that we've been working on since the beginning and input all of the footage that we captured and it will set that foundation. So in the example, it said, find B-roll for this scene. It will pull the B-roll that most aligns with that voiceover there and just map it out. So the video editors are able to go in and now refine, do we wanna switch out that scene or do we actually really like it? And now we only have to focus on color correcting or things like that. Um, and really the, the cherry on top here it also syncs up to any original music or music that you've uploaded as well. So all those tedious tasks that really just take a while to just get to that first version, we're able to, to use these tools and, and free up more time to how do we make it the best that we can. So these are just really exciting tools that uh, and our video team has been very eager to, to continue to use. 
Yeah, these are really great examples of, of different workflows that are just made much more efficient with with the you know technologies that we have available today. And it is it is pretty crazy to think of like how much more quickly we can do some of these workflows than we we have in years past. And it you know it, it frees up more time holistically for our creative teams to do that creative ideation and, and design work. Um, and to that point, like I know that there's a lot of discussion out there around generative AI tools working with creating new visuals, whether it's vi automated videos or, or images. But, you know, are you using those in that capacity? What, what is really the right balance between the, the human creativity and, you know, using AI tools for, for, those, um, for those workflows? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it really is about finding that balance. Like Jackson, you mentioned, it's about making our workflows more efficient um, rather than replacing our designers where our design teams are able to work with these AI tools. Um, so there are certain human skills that AI currently can't replicate. So things like curiosity and observation. An AI tool is taking a series of inputs. It's generating some sort of output. Maybe that's copy, maybe that's uh, some sort of design design asset or video, um, but it's really not able to take a holistic view of the creative campaign and under uncover gaps, um, find holes or inefficiencies, um, and see where we can really push the boundaries creatively. So this is really about making our initial brainstorming phases more efficient. Um, this image here on the left, the elephant butterfly, this was an example that the Harvard Business Review pulled um, they asked an AI tool, okay, make me a combination of an elephant and a butterfly. So they received this, this image on the left here, um, and they were able to re-input it back into that AI tool and say, okay, what are, what's a series of products we could create using this image as inspiration? Uh, so now they have 40, 40 product images on the right here, um, and they're saving their team time from having to go through all this initial iterations and initial brainstorming, whereas now their team can pick maybe three, three images that are most relevant and continue to refine and optimize from there. Um, so again, it's really about being more efficient in our workflow um, and thinking about these AI tools as assistance to our workflow rather than um, replacements. Exactly. Um, on the next slide here, I pulled one of the quotes actually from that article that I think sums it up perfectly that the, the greatest power of these generative AI tools is not to replace humans, but to just fuel us and help us create these unimaginable solutions. This is really meant to be a resource for those creatives who maybe haven't had the resources to create or maybe didn't have the technical skills to bring their visions to life. Now, that ability to, to do so. It'll help brands experiment a little bit more, move a little bit faster. So it really is meant to supercharge everything that we've been working on. And our, I know our creative team has really much embraced it because they see it as that. They see it as a tool rather than um, a threat. So I just think that this this quote here really embodies that, that position. I definitely think that's true. I think that is this this point here is true actually across all of the different applications of AI that we've we've talked about today. But I think none more than in the creative side of things. Um, also, I think Catherine on the what you were speaking to before. I think to, I just want to call out. I think that that tool that was being used for that was was Mid Journey. In case anyone was interested, um, what is the most creative way you've seen a brand leverage AI in in creative in their campaigns? Yeah, I'm super excited about this video. I'm sure many of you guys have seen it. Uh, it's gone viral and rightfully so. It is the campaign that Orange did for the, friend, uh, for the France women's national team for soccer. It's really awesome. It is a reel of these incredible moments in the game. There's goals, there's saves, people are po uh, pivoting the music if you actually hear it separately. It just gets you going and it's really exciting. And then about halfway through the video, you realize that all of these key moments were actually performed by the women's national team. So not only are they using these awesome technologies to essentially fool you, but the, the bigger message is that women's sports is as exciting or arguably more exciting than, than the men's team. So it was just really cool to see how such brilliant minds came up with this concept, but then also adding that layer of answering a, a kind of social social norm and something super relevant right now as the Women's World Cup is on. So I just thought this was super cool. If you haven't seen it, I de definitely recommend you watching it from the beginning, but from here you can see how it's, it's really changed. So super awesome. 
Yeah, and I love this campaign from GoFundMe that they released at the beginning of the year. You can see on the video, the video on the left here, um, it's a two minute animated video um, that they created utilizing a design team and then also a series of AI tools. Uh, so their design team was able to work with these AI tools to um, really refine and tweak until they got this final artistic style where it felt like every frame is its own painting. Um, and then they, on the video on the right here, we see um, using real life actors and overlaying this design style onto these, these videos of real people and tweaking and refining um, until they finally got this frame by frame animated video. Um, and then finally their design team actually went in and made sure that every frame, every object was in this really um, painting-like design style to make sure that it was this seamless animated video. Um, so I really loved this example because it's such a great w example of ways that uh, we can again make our workflow so much more efficient when um, our design teams are working with these AI tools. Really cool examples. I, I, I love these. Uh, Thank you guys. I, I think those were really awesome examples of how uh, we can use and we are using um, and hopefully that our, our listeners can, can, can use um, to just make the creative process more efficient um, and get their really well thought out creative uh, campaigns into market faster. Uh, thank you guys so much. We still have a lot of people here and Thank you for giving us the time. We really appreciate it. I want to invite back all of our wonderful speakers because we're going to make a few minutes and stay on for a Q and A. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, uh, throw them out to us. And welcome back, everybody. Valentina, I did not see that video um, of that you referenced. That's very cool. It's so good. I'll, I'll slack it to everyone. <laughs> Um, okay, so we do have a couple questions. I will walk through them. Um, continue to chat us your questions. Please feel free. Um, okay, so uh, first question. So how are we going to manage copyright and security if we are pulling full footage and images from the internet? Um, are there thoughts on that? Yeah, I think on the creative um, side as well um, with copyright and security, it's about using, um, again, these tools in the initial ideation phase and the brainstorming phase. Um, but then when we're, we're actually going to uh, create videos or create, um, create final assets, it's building those original designs. Um, so again, using these as tools that can help us in that brainstorming and ideation um, phase of the project. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so second question. Um, so we mentioned, uh, we were talking a little bit about copywriting. It said, you mentioned you currently can't rely on AI to create written copy without humans. Is there a future where you think that changes? I'll, I'll jump in on this. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, this, these technologies are going to continue to, to get better. So there's a world in the not too distant future where, um, you know, it'll be able to generate, you know, pretty decent copy from scratch or, or, or good, you know, blog posts or whatever. Um, but I think what is going to remain the same is that AI tools are not going to replace, um, you know, skilled workers and, and creatives and strategists. Um, really, I think what will happen is that we are going to the you know the the best people in 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 the industries are going to leverage these tools and so um you know th that's where i think this is going where um you know the people who are using these tools to make them better at their jobs more efficient um will really just kind of surpass those who are kind of stuck in the mud and not fully embracing the, these technologies um, okay, great. There's another one um, that I, Catherine, you, you more or less answered. Uh, does the direct agents creative team ever use AI generated images and videos in campaigns? I can answer this one. Um, never for final iteration. So I, like you said, we kind of touched on this before. We use it as mood boards, as inspiration if we want to see how a campaign can potentially be visualized. But that's really to the extent of it. We want to make sure that our designers and our experts are the ones designing it. One, because 
we believe in them and we know that at the end of the day, I know that they'll make work better than than these uh, AR platforms and just I just believe in them. But it really is to make sure that we're also having original artwork out there, that we're making sure that we're really doing the work. So it is that jumping off point, um, but mm -hmm. never in final campaigns have we leveraged it or will we be leveraging it. Okay, and then uh, one of our final questions, um, what are your opinions on the security risk of uploading data to open source? All right, that's a okay. That's a tough one. So I'm not I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think it's a very valid question. I think the, um, the reason I said I'm not a lawyer is because I think the answer is there is an inherent risk when you upload any data um, onto any sort of either um, online service. Um, you know, we we've seen a lot of a lot of hacks, a lot of things going on. Honestly, there was even a bug exposed in ChatGPT um, a few months ago that kind of went under the radar. Look there. You should be concerned, and my advice would be do not upload proprietary important data into these uh, online services at this time. If um, I think the question was specific around data, so if, if possible, um, especially if we're talking about marketing data, you know, um, I would um, try to anonymize the data as much as possible if there is sensitive information, um, whether, if that's a company name, change the name, find and replace, like just get something else in there. Um, but the honest question is, I think a lot still needs to be figured out from a legal perspective. Um, and so hopefully that is a very relevant conversation that we'll see unfold as AI gets more and more ingrained in our day to day life. But treat it the same way you would treat any sensitive data where you want to upload sensitive information into even a basic note taking app. God forbid there's a data breach. So just carry yourself with that. Have some cause and don't just go uploading anything you want into these systems just yet. That would be my my best advice possible um, as we're all trying to figure this out. Great, thank you, Corey. Um, so that's just about it for us. I know we're already a little over time. I know we covered a lot today. So I will say if questions pop up as you think about this webinar or anything, please feel free to email marketing at directagents.com those questions. They will send them to this group. We will get answers back to you. Uh, and as always, if you do want to talk with, um, speak with Google a little bit more about any of the AI or tools or implications for your campaigns, also please reach out to marketingattractagents.com. We will set up office hours. We will set up a time to chat. Um, we'll also follow up with some type of um, takeaway doc so that everybody has some information from this to move forward with. But thank you all so, so very much for the last hour of your day. We really appreciate it. It's been really fun chatting about AI. I'm sure we'll do many more of these in the future. And thank you to all of the wonderful panelists um, and a special shout out to Alex and Amanda joining us from Google. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and we will talk to you all soon. Thank you.